You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. As I looked, thrones were placed. Notice it's not one throne. It's a lot of thrones. This is the divine council. We've talked about that. This is why we went through the unseen realm for 25 weeks before we got to Daniel. We wanted to understand what is going on in the spiritual realm because Daniel goes into that realm and we've got to understand what's happening because he's talking from a spiritual perspective. He's saying there's a reality, then there's reality. And reality is the spiritual realm. Compared to eternity, life is just a hiccup in the expanse of time. And while we're here, God is still planning and preparing for the things to come. Today, we see that not only God will be on his throne, but there will also be a divine council, as it is called. Pastor Ken continues to detail and dissect the words of Daniel in a comprehensive study that brings a fresh perspective to the things of God. We may get busy with our daily lives, but take a moment today and thank God for a safe and secure eternity waiting for you. Well, Let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, as he continues his message, World History in Advance. So this picture of this beast is pretty true. And when you start taking a look at what the way the Romans operated, the way that they they worked, and especially when you start studying Roman politics, I wouldn't encourage you to do that unless you like studying U.S. politics, because there's not a lot of difference. The only difference is in Roman politics, if you didn't like it, they'd just stab you and put somebody else in your place. By the way, studying the Roman Senate from 220 B.C. and the U.S. Senate from 2018, there's no difference. Solomon's right. There's nothing new under the sun. There really isn't. But the Roman Empire is clearly described here in this fourth beast. And by the way, Rome, large. This is the Roman Empire at its fullest extent. It never went to India, and they never conquered the Parthian Empire, which was the section of India. So in the scriptures, when you see the magi, the wise men, come in to see Jesus, they're coming from the Parthian Empire. The Romans fought a war 15 years before that, and they did not beat them. They beat the Romans. The Parthians were tougher than the Romans were. And then all of a sudden these three wise men show up with their retinue, probably a couple thousand men. Uh, They travel with an army. And they show up and they say, where's your king? No wonder they were a little upset at that time. But you see, the, this is the extent of their conquering. They took the entire Mediterranean at one point. They used to be called Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. The reason why there was peace was because nobody would dare fight them. They were the first empire to come up with a professional military. They called them legions. They would recruit a group of people all at once, usually teenagers of around 14 years of age. They would enlist for 18 years. And at the end of the first enlistment, they would all be citizens in Rome. Now, if they wanted to, they could re-up for another 18 years. Then they'd be called centurions and officers. And after that, if they wanted another 18 years, they'd be higher-ranking officers. But, I mean, you had a professional military. That's what these guys did. That's all they did. And when you'd see the army move, you'd have 18,000 people and all their families behind them. So it was a large group, and it was just all the food, everything that was going on. It was, a, it was a large, large army. But this is Rome. This is what it looked like at its furthest extent. This is who this fourth beast is. It's Rome, but it's also something else. We get more attention given to the fourth beast here in the scriptures than the other three put together. So it's important for us to know, it's very important for us to know, because we're living in the time of the fourth beast. What, we're living in the Roman Empire? No, we're living in the second half of it. The Roman Empire never was conquered, it just kind of the western side went one direction, the eastern side lasted till the Middle Ages, almost 1500 actually. And there are elements of it that still exist in a lot of places today. You know, you have the European common market, the EU, which is trying to come back together, almost trying to recreate what was in Rome at that time. And they're having their problems with it, uh, just like Rome did. Uh, because they, don't, they talk different languages, they don't get along, they all have different ways of wanting to do things. But we're, this is important to us because we're in the time where these horns begin to manifest. At some point, there's going to be 10 specific world leaders that are going to oversee and somehow align with the old Roman Empire, I guess. I don't know. 
But the fourth kingdom is Rome. We see that. Again, talking about the Romans, if you refuse to surrender to them, they would conquer you, kill all the men, and sell everybody else into slavery. That, great folks. Great, great folks. So as you look at chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, and you look at chapter 7, you see a lot of the same information. Same kingdoms, same order, one's going to follow another, another, and another. But chapter 2 is man's view of those kingdoms. Nebuchadnezzar's the one having the dream. And they're precious metals. There's value to them. But Daniel sees as God sees. And all God sees is immoral beasts that do nothing but kill and destroy and maim. And the fourth one is even worse. It just ruthlessly devours people and nations. You know, so the difference is man will see something of value, God doesn't see anything of value at all. Now, the ten horns that are identified, if you know what they are, please see me afterwards. Because nobody knows. We'd love to know who they are. We don't know who they are. It's like the ten toes of the statue. We don't know who they are either. There's similarity between the ten horns and the ten toes of chapter 2. They are ten contemporaneous rulers. They all have to be ruling at the same time. And because they have to be contemporaneous, this is another reason why it, it's pointing to something probably in the future, because there was at no point in time that there were ten contemporaneous rulers against the Roman Empire or ruling. with. The, uh, you can come up with all these different scenarios, but they, they just don't fit. There are some people who say, oh, there were ten different rulers of the Roman Empire. No, but they had to all be at the same time, okay? And they weren't. They never did rule at the same time. But at a point in the near future, it could be happening today. God will be working to revive or realign the Roman Empire or elements of it, and there will be ten rulers who will come up out of this. You know, I don't know if Donald Trump is one of them. You know, you get people who say that. You don't know. You know, because a lot of this is going to happen, in my mind, after the church is taken from this world. So I'm not going to conjecture. It's just fun to watch. You can see the deck chairs being moved around a little bit. And then we see uh, there's an 11th horn that rises amongst the 10, and it displaces three of them. So there's going to be someone who comes to power, takes out three of these other rulers and their territory, and he has eyes and speaks boastful things. And immediately I start thinking about Revelation chapter 13. So Revelation 13, verses 1 to 9. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, reflecting the fact that those three had already been conquered. With ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. You catching the imagery here? He's picking elements of those other kingdoms and bringing them together. And to it the dragon gave his power. The dragon is Satan. Okay? And his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Remember, Daniel never identifies this like anything else he'd ever seen. It's a beast. And we're seeing in Revelation, it's a beast. Who's like the beast? Who can fight against it? The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world, in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Okay, so Daniel's watching this. He's seen these beasts. We've kind of taken a look that, yep, here's the beast in Daniel. Here it is in Revelation. More to come on that, but there they are. And as Daniel is observing all of this, then he starts to see something else. So he's watching the, the, the ocean, he's watching the Mediterranean, and he sees these beasts come out, and then he hears chairs being moved, apparently. And he turns around and he begins to see another scene. He's seeing something else unfold. He's seeing the divine council beginning to set up. He's beginning to see the throne room of the universe being set up for a specific issue. It's a classic view of the courtroom of the universe. Verse 9, as I looked, 
thrones were placed. Notice it's not one throne. It's a lot of thrones. This is the divine council. We've talked about that. This is why we went through the unseen realm for 25 weeks before we got to Daniel. We wanted to understand what is going on in the spiritual realm because Daniel goes into that realm and we've got to understand what's happening because he's talking from a spiritual perspective. He's saying there's a reality, then there's reality. And reality is the spiritual realm. As I look, thrones were placed in the Ancient of Days took his seat. That's Yahweh. That's God. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Anybody starting to think about Ezekiel? Yeah, chapter 1? I'm beginning to see Ezekiel just in that description right there. Wheels with burning fire. Yep, I'm seeing Ezekiel. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. And as you look at that, there are several things that start leaping out at you almost immediately as you review that scripture. Number one, we know the Ancient of Days is the God of Israel. It's Yahweh. That is a common picture that shows up over and over again. The vision that he sees of the wheels and the fire matches Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel 1, 26 to 27, including the human figure on the throne. Second, we see that there are a lot of thrones in heaven, not just one. Thrones are set up. These thrones mark the presence of the divine council. This is the heavenly host. Remember, he's the God of the heavenly host. This is the heavenly host. They're coming together. It's time for a decision to be made. There's something happening. They need to be involved. And the council is being called to decide the fate of these four beasts that just came out of an ocean. So, okay, we have the council, and they're going to decide what needs to happen to these four kingdoms, these four empires. That's why they're there. So let's go to Revelation chapter 4. This is the same scene, a different eyewitness. His name is John. John gets to see the same thing, starting in verse 2. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. John had a little more command to language. Maybe he saw more, maybe he saw Star Wars once or twice. I don't know. But he was able to tell us a little bit more information than Daniel was. And had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders. So he's getting a little better picture than Daniel did. Daniel was probably told to stay back in the back. John's up front. He gets to see the detail. 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. We're both, both of them are giving us the view of the same courtroom. We have Daniel who gives us this description, John gives us this description, but when you start matching them together, they start, they start folding together. This image conveys a sense of purity and wisdom. We see that the judge is is the God of the universe. He's on his throne and when you look, 10,000 times 10,000 is a hundred million. That's a big group showing up for this, this court, okay? I don't know about you, but I've never seen a hundred million people in one place at one time. But Daniel's seeing it. He says there's thousands and thousands that are serving God, but there's over a hundred million waiting to see what the court's going to do. The book's opened. It means that the session's about to begin. Court's about to set up. And the thing that just draws you and that I don't understand is that Daniel points out that here the court is, everything's set up, and he hears this little horn boasting again. Really? What's going on with that? So we're in the throne room, we're prepared to meet, we see the scene, there's a second eyewitness, John, and somebody's boasting? Yeah, there is. Uh, Verse 11 of chapter 7, I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. So the court's there, and this beast, this horn, we saw it as a beast in Revelation, it's a horn in Daniel, it's wanting to be heard, even before God. And it's complaining to God. 
we remember we learned in Revelation he's actually empowered by Satan. But I like what Daniel says. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. And as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So that's why we kind of see what we see in history. They didn't totally disappear. But this last kingdom, there's going to be a definite end. And this horn is going to be taken and given over to be burned with fire. Now, where do we see that in the book of Revelation? We see the same thing, actually, in Revelation 19, verse 20. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. And this is one of the best sections of Scripture that I love. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. May God bless his word. I mean, that's the end of the Antichrist, the beast. That's their end. They're going to be thrown alive into hell. They'll be the first two occupants. Satan won't be there for another thousand years. But they're going to be thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds that were gorged with their flesh. The rest are the armies that were following the beast and were trying to stop Jesus Christ from taking over planet earth, which is what he's going to do. We're going to be part of that army. We'll get to see all this. You know, study it carefully because you're going to see it first person if you're a believer. And the army gets wiped out. So that's Revelation 19, 20, and 21. The horn, the beast, they're the same. Their end is the same. Now, we've moved rapidly from an overview of history to scenes that we identify as taking place at the end of, tri of the tribulation. We've gone from 500 B.C. to what? I don't know. You know, Take today, add seven years. No, that's not going to... I'm, then I'm predicting. I can't do that. It's a, it's a point in the future, okay? But even after being captured per Daniel, the beast, this little horn, continues to try and make his case heard. You know, he's going to continue to say, oh no, you're wrong. I'm God. You're not God. I should be worshipped, not you. Who does that sound like? Who, who did we learn, started all of this back in Genesis 3? Satan. I mean, and you take a look at what it says in Isaiah, and you see what it sees in Ezekiel, and it's the same thing. He thinks he should be in charge. And he's going to continue to try and have his case heard, no matter what. But they're thrown alive into the lake of fire. Verse 13 of Daniel 7. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And that is Jesus Christ, exactly. In the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, showing up in the throne room, he's the son of man. It says that right there. He comes to the Ancient of Days and he gets everything as a result of what he did on the cross. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It shall not pass away. We see that also in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. You saw in Daniel, he's coming with the clouds. Revelation, coming with the clouds. That's a picture that actually goes back to Mesopotamian history. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week, but you know the cloud rider and the whole thing around that. But And then there's also a picture that the clouds could also be the believers around him. I mean, you have all these different pieces of imagery and pictures that are possible. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen, I'm the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. We see Daniel giving us that picture. We see Revelation giving us that picture. But Daniel 7.13 describes someone who looks to be human, coming on or with the clouds to the Ancient of Days, to God. And that points to the fact that throughout the Old Testament we see there's Yahweh and then there's this other figure, the son of, you know, we see it's the angel of Yahweh, it's the word of God, but we don't see anywhere where he's like the son of man. This is the first time we see that referenced in the scriptures. 
And it clearly points that he is also God. The imagery that's there, anybody reading it from, from the time period of Daniel would immediately know that the Ancient of Days is, is Yahweh and the Son of Man is also Yahweh. They would know that they're both the same. And they would believe that both were the same. So we're back to this concept that goes back to the Old Testament. The Old Testament teaches that there is a Father and there is a Son and that there is a Holy Spirit. That's there. By the way, in Matthew chapter 26, remember when in verse 63 that there is another reference to this coming on the clouds? Jesus makes this reference when he's asked by Caiaphas, uh, you need to tell me. Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. So Jesus has been asked to do this. And what Jesus does is he quotes from Daniel. He points right back to it. You've said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. They know what he just said. He said, I'm that person. In Daniel 7, I'm that, I'm, I'm that person. That's why the high priest tore his robes and said he's uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You've now heard the blasphemy. Jesus made it very clear to them. He is God. He identified himself as God. And he points back to the book of Daniel to say that. It's kind of a cryptic answer, really. Uh, it's a very clear question. But he is quoting Daniel 7.13. He is pointing to the fact he's Yahweh. He's the second person that's always been there. He's the Malek Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh. He's the word of God. He's the one who is always there with Yahweh. He is also God. And of course, they understood that and they said, let's put him to death. But he's also Yahweh. And he's the one that will take over and undo everything that started in Genesis 3, everything that took place in Genesis 6, everything that took place in Genesis 11. He undoes all of it because of what he did on the cross. Now, the judgment does not come to an end with just the destruction of this world power in its various embodiments. That's just the first act. There's another act that we see coming up, which is the erection of the kingdom of God by the Son of Man. That's yet to come in chapter 7. So we have the end of the earthly nations, but there's more to come. And like I said, there's a lot to unpack here in chapter 7. I mean, they, you know, we got we to slow down a little bit to get it all. There's a lot here, and we'll back up a little bit next week and cover a little bit more about the cloud rider and all of that, and then start unpacking this next section. Daniel will actually ask a question of one of the divine beings. Well, what's this all mean? And it gets explained to him. But then he also finds out about the kingdom taking over. And we'll dig more into that next week when we get back into chapter 7. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clear picture that you give us in your scriptures that you are coming and coming very soon. And we love the fact that you have prepared a place for us and that you've spent 2,000 years doing that. It just blows my mind when I think about what that must look like after you've been working on it that long. Come quickly, Lord. We're just ready for you to come. But at the same time, we want to see thousands, millions more come to know you. Help us to be about your business until you do show up and take us home. Thank you for this picture that you're showing us in your scriptures. Help us to take it to heart as these are things that are going to be happening or have happened as Daniel describes them to us. Thank you again for your word, Lord, and help us just to rest in you as we continue to labor in your fields that you've said are white unto harvest. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's message was in the book of Daniel, an Old Testament prophecy book. Pastor Ken has been teaching about some great things from this book here on The Unsafe Bible. Imagine living most of your adult life in a foreign land. This was what God had for Daniel, but the way God used him was powerful. In the land of Babylon, Daniel witnessed many kingdoms come and go, rise to power and fall to others. But under several kings, Daniel found favor because he honored God along the way. Wouldn't you love to be known for honoring God all of your life? It wasn't an easy road for Daniel to take, but when he was faced with each trial or opposition, he put God as number one, and God blessed him and gave him high esteem. 
If you want to hear more about Daniel's life and journey through these things, you can listen to additional teachings at theunsafebible.com. While you're there, feel free to get a better understanding of what we believe and what our core foundation is built on by going to the About tab at theunsafebible.com. Do you live in the Jupiter, Florida area? If so, you're welcome to join us for these kinds of messages in person. You'll notice ways to contact us on our website so you can find out when and where we meet each week. Go to theunsafebible.com and look for the Connect tab. We're so glad you took the time today to hear from God's Word. Pastor Ken has more to share with you from the book of Daniel, so don't miss a single edition. Continue growing on your own and then come back for more on The Unsafe Bible.